Live from New York City, it's The Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll, broadcasting from our studios in New York City. Today, we're going to find out how walnuts lower our cardiovascular disease risk factor and at the same time boost our endothelium function, which is the lining of the arteries. And when that's healthy, well, we have less opportunity for heart attacks and strokes. And that's a major study, by the way. And also how bacteria has been found in Alzheimer's brains, University of Bristol. I mean, a lot of brains have bacteria. How? How that bacteria get there? What does it mean? Can we prevent it? Can we reverse it? I'll share that. Also, for any woman going through menopause, and if you've had hot flashes or night sweats, some brand new research on fermented red clover extract stops menopausal hot flashes and symptoms. That's brand new, and that's, I like to read things in the scientific literature before they get out, and that's from Aris University in Denmark. And then a diet rich in tomatoes, and that includes tomato juice and tomato paste and tomato sauce, cut skin cancer in half, Ohio State University, and a lot more on health and healing. I'm not going to have a guest today. Instead, I want to play some videos and then ask you to call in to share your points of view. The whole idea of sharing a point of view is that it's constructive and can empower people. And it's all about two issues. One is this whole idea that we've become a nation that seems to be offended by almost everything. Well, why? And how relevant is it? And what happens when a group decides that what you are about, what you believe, either how you dress or what you eat or what you say, what memberships you have, offends them, and therefore they don't want to see that. So they ban you, or they censor your freedom of speech. That's one issue. Separate issue is the millennials are taking a... um, uh, they're, they're taking center stage in those individuals who are older, who believe that maybe there's some lessons they should be learning to better help them prepare for the real world that they're going to be faced with. Okay, well, what about the people who are in that real world and have been a part of its construction but have taken no responsibility, like the X generation, my generation, the baby boomers, the senior citizen generation. Have we not all participated in putting us to where we're at at this moment? What about those who eat just are good people, but they eat meat? Well, that's contributing to global warming in a major way, more than all the cars, planes, trains, um, buses, and ships combined. And how about the people who say, yeah, I, I want to see Americans work. How much do you want to see them work? Are you willing to support the Garments Made in America? I am. I, I was the nutritionist for the Ladies International Garment uh, Workers Union. And I helped them over a period of a couple of years get a lot of health back that they were missing. They were sitting all day eating candy, had diabetes, but they were at least making a living wage. They had some representation, good representation, to help them in their collective bargaining for a safer work environment. Well, if I support America, then I want to be able to look in the back of my shirt and see a tag that says Made in USA, or at least, if not that, made by fair labor standards in countries that also have strong support for the men and women, generally women, making the clothes. But what if your clothes have been based upon the style and the cost? You wanted something to look nice, but you didn't want to pay much for it, so it was made in Bangladesh, where they make 14 cents an hour. They work 18-hour days. Men walk up and down the aisles with switches, and they have stopwatch. Now, time how long it takes you to sew a patch on or a zipper. And if it's not fast enough, they whack you, and you have no recourse. Because in Bangladesh, women have no power. And at midnight, when you're at home and you're sleeping, you'll hear footsteps of tens of thousands of women walking because they can't afford public transportation, a bus or a train, walking home. Once they get home, they then have to make their food for the next day for their family, wash their clothes, clean up the house, get a few hours sleep, and go back to that work. Now think of all the times 
we wanted to do the right thing, but we didn't. So before we unload any intemperance upon the millennials, shouldn't we take a look at each of our generations and how we've contributed to destroying the finite resources, the overcrowding, in effect, the destruction of our society? So I'm going to play a couple of videos, and then we'll open it up for your comments of all ages of all groups, not just millennials. Our talkback number, by the way, is 888-874-4888, 888-874-4888. Now, let's say that you're not able to listen right now because you're not at a land-based station that we're heard on around the United States or even a computer. Any portable listening device, you can call and listen live. That number, 712-775-6850, 712-775-6850. Or if you have no time at all and you've got to listen to it late at night, just call our archival number, 701-719-9976. Also today, I'm going to deal with a lot of issues that the mainstream media refuses to touch, or if they do deal with it, It's always in a very biased manner. So we've got a lot to share with you. So let's begin. First up, I work with a lot of people who have Alzheimer's. It's not a quick process. I generally tell people it's going to take about two to three years of being consistent. Now, if they're in a controlled environment, that's best. If they're not, then you gotta worry about, well, are they going to drink what they're, their drink they're supposed to? Are they going to take their foods in the way they're supposed to? Are they going to get up and exercise? Unless they're under care, you don't know if that's going to happen. And even if they are having a caregiver, has that person been instructive how they got to go for a walk every two hours? They have to have a certain amount of liquid because they'll dehydrate. They're not aware that they're not drinking enough, and they can suffer from either polydipsia or hydrodipsia, either too much water or too little water. They have to have their nutrients spaced throughout the day. So there's a lot that goes in to working with a person with Alzheimer's or dementia or multiple sclerosis or ALS. It's the same. I only have one protocol for all that, and it works. <clears throat> and a lot of the times, depending upon how far gone they are and how much someone's willing to commit to that effort. Now, this is a new piece of the puzzle. This is the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom, and it says, quote, researchers in the United Kingdom have used DNA sequencing to examine a bacteria in post-mortem brains. That means after they've died, they've autopsied the brain. From patients with Alzheimer's disease, their findings suggest increased bacterial populations and different proportions of specific bacteria in Alzheimer's compared with healthy brains. The findings may support evidence the bacterial infection and inflammation in the brain could contribute to Alzheimer's disease. Now, you know and I know that Alzheimer's is a neurodegenerative disease that results in cognitive decline and eventually death. And in the brain, the disease causes neurons to die and break down and involves high levels of peptides called amyloid and aggregations of a protein called um, tau, T-A-U. However, scientists are coming to appreciate the inflammation may play a key role. Now, I've been sharing with you for a long time, and hopefully you're more cognizant of why it's so important in all conditions, is the anti-inflammatory diet. And that means that the foods and beverages you take have to be anti-inflammatory, meaning they don't cause inflammation, they actually turn off inflammation. So when you have a get glass of apple juice, that's anti-inflammatory. If you really want to spike it, throw a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar in it, a tablespoon of lemon juice in that apple juice. If you want something even more powerful for your brain or someone who has brains that are aging, you can take the skin of five apples, just peel the skin of an organic apple, put it in a blender, save the rest of the apple. You, that's fine to juice. But you want those polyphenols. You want the quercetin. You spike that with about two, 4,000 milligrams of quercetin, and then you put your apple cider vinegar, lemon juice, and ginger in there, and you drink that down. And, you know, it's about 16 ounces of liquid, but that you want that. Now, there's a lot more you could do with that. 
pomegranate. In fact, each day I make myself a, a very particular uh, rejuvenation beverage. It has about 18 ingredients in it. And on another program, I'll share that with you. In fact, starting this week, I'm going to post on my website, on my both GaryAnall.com, on ProgressiveRadioNetwork.com or PRN.FM, and my Facebook, I'm going to post anti-aging recipes. You'll see a picture, but then you'll get the actual recipe. And it's free. It's a public service. And which drinks you should have each day, depending upon the condition you have. But the key is every drink should be anti-inflammatory. Now, compare that also with everything you eat should either be promoting prebiotics or high fiber or probiotics, meaning when you eat, you should be eating to recolonize the healthy biome, the bacteria, the good bacteria in your intestine. Remember, the bacteria in your intestine communicates in the same way that neurons in the brain communicate. You've got up here in your skull, you have a brain, but in your gut you have a skull. You, ha- you have a brain, you have over 100 billion neurons. So if you have good bacteria in the gut, your whole body, the DNA, turns on healing, anti-inflammatory, and stronger immune system. On the other end, if you eat sugar, soft drinks, coffee, alcohol, even in moderation, you're turning on bad bacteria and you're turning off healing to the DNA. I'm going to have Dr. Bruce Lipton on on an upcoming program to explain. It'll take a full hour. I'm going to devote the entire hour to it. How you're either turning on the DNA or you're turning off the DNA as far as the energy that allows healing or diseasing to occur. So when you look in the diet of the average person, especially an older person, you see that it was principally inflammatory foods. Most common is meat. And it's understandable because everyone I know, good people, loving people, thoughtful people, believed their doctor. So they smoked. Major full-page ads. I, I've collected them all, by the way, for a new documentary I'm doing. And I have over 60 full-page ads in the Mer- Journal of the American Medical Association encouraging women to smoke. Calm their nerves, soothe their throat. All right? Could you imagine giving something that causes emphysema and lung cancer and bronchitis? What causes the disease you're saying to take to prevent it? And 46,000 doctors recommend Chesterfields. And 44,000 doctors, lucky strikes. And then everyone believed, as did my mother, that you had to feed meat three times a day. In fact, it was a sign of our working middle class upbringing that my mother could provide us with a piece of meat at night. And it was particularly important. You you went to the butcher and you got a two-inch piece. Why two inches? I have no idea. I later would go to a butcher, and I would ask him to cut me a two-inch piece of meat. I weighed it, and then I saw how much was fat, approximately, how much was protein. I then took it into the lab, and I measured there's over 2,000 calories in that one single item. No wonder we had problems with weight. But also, there is four times the amount of protein what the body could actually use. And when you can't use that amount of protein, there's no way of storing protein, so it breaks down with urea and ammonium. And it ends up with toxic reactions to the kidneys and the liver. And, but no one knew that. We didn't know. People thought that was the right thing to do. So a lot of things that we've been conditioned and live by ritual of doing are unhealthy. So when a person gets to an age where now they're suffering from memory loss, and that starts in your 30s and accelerates, until where you have dementia or beginning of Alzheimer's in your 60s or 70s, you've already had a lifetime of killing cells and altering the DNA and altering the mitochondria and altering the neurons. So you have to be very, very extensively radical in reversing it, meaning you can't be conservative and be healthy. 
it's not humanly possible. Let me say that again. Because once I said you can't be overweight and be healthy, people thought, oh, that's crazy. Well, now all the science is proving that because of the pro-inflammatory condition, the excess estrogen that is released that can precipitate a higher level of prostate cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, a gazillion different ways that you're going to be unhealthy, even though you'll show no classical sign. You see, here's the, one of the thousands of limitations in orthodox medicine. They only recognize you as diseased when you manifest a classical symptom. Well, chronic fatigue syndrome, you're not going to manifest that. Frequently, Lyme's disease, you won't manifest it. Most of your uh, stress disorders, you won't manifest it. And you really won't manifest cancer until 30 years after you've been processing it. You won't manifest clogging the arteries till long after they've been clogged. And then when you have your heart attack or stroke or cancer, then suddenly you're diagnosed. <clears throat> so, we have to understand that if something is toxic in a small amount, a part per billion, so small you can't see it, it's still toxic. And sooner or later, when synergistically combined with all the other things that are bad for you, you manifest a symptom. Then you're way past making healthy choices. So we have to understand our body processes every single thing we think, we're exposed to, we say, we feel, we eat and drink and breathe to our betterment or to our detriment. So it's just something to consider. Now, this is about fermented red clover. And red clover is a very healthy item to take in any case. And, quote, fermented red clover extract stops menopausal hot flashes and symptoms. And this is from uh, RS uh, University in Denmark. Here's what it says. The vast majority of women in the menopause in menopause are familiar with the status of red clover as an herbal medicine that soothes hot flashes and hormonal fluctuations. This holds true, new research shows, if the red clover is taken in a fermented fo uh, form. Fermented red clover extract is demonstrated to decrease significantly both the number and severity of daily hot flashes. The study also found that the extract prevents the normally accelerated menopausal bone loss of, uh, affecting one in three women over the age of 50. And results show the treatment stopped bone loss in the spine completely. These findings are very promising as the benefits take place without any of the side effects of traditional prescribed hormone therapies that increase the risk of cancers and cardiovascular disease. All right, and this was published in PLOS One, a very respected journal. Now, this coming Saturday, it'll be my final webinar for the next at least four or five months because of my schedule of traveling. But it'll be on menopause. Now, I didn't know. I just read the study earlier this morning. So I'll be sharing that information. But everything else you can do to either prevent or mitigate or reverse menopausal symptoms to you literally get younger again. Lose weight, get your energy back, get your hair back, color back, eyebrows back, your metabolism normalized, uh, your fingernails, toenails strong and, and shiny and red instead of brittle and cracked and fungus, uh, your libido back, the thinning of the mucous membranes in your vagina, which nobody talks about, but they should because an awful lot of women cannot have normal relationships with their partner because they would end up with infections and bleeding and uh, because there's no moisture. Well, how do you get that moisture back? It's not that difficult. So all the things menopausal, I'll be taking questions as well as showing you a film, and it'll be about three hours long. You can go to my website for that. And finally... This is from Ohio State University. A diet rich in tomatoes cut skin cancer in half in this study. And that's important, big time. Quote, a new study of how nutritional interventions can alter the risk of skin cancers appeared online in the journal Scientific Reports. And then they talk about the, uh, the diet that in this particular scientific study on rats, they used 10% uh, tomato in the diet. 
Well, if you're Italian, 10% of tomato in the diet's about right. That's an awful lot of tomatoes they use, and they're one of the healthiest people in the world. If they stick to the traditional Italian, Mediterranean, French, Portuguese, Greek, Spain diet. There, there's three sides to the Mediterranean. The western, northern Mediterranean is what they're referring to when they talk about the Mediterranean diet. The eastern side of the Mediterranean, <clears throat> no, those are the old eastern Europe and, you know, the Bulgarias. Go through that whole section going even above out in northeast, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, uh, and then it's now it's broken into Croatia and Herzegovina and all the other cities and major places through there. That's the Eastern Mediterranean diet, and it's one of the least healthy in the world. Very high in meat, uh, generally some tubers, lots of sugar. But it, uh, once again, you can still be healthy there. I know people who come from that area of the world, and they live on farms, and they have orchards, and they grow vegetables part of the year. And uh, But it's principally a meat-dairy-based diet, and everything is frequently overcooked. So, in fact, a friend of mine uh, brought her mother and father, who were both dying, and uh, to see me. And uh, I, I helped them for a month, every day. And they overcame all diseases that they weren't helped with over there. And went back, and I, I never will forget this conversation I had two outstanding artists, by the way, very famous in their own country. <clears throat> and I said, you realize when you go home, you're going to have to change the food you eat. And my friend said, oh, there's farmer's markets, and there's, there's even some vegetarian restaurants now, and they never had before, and, and I'm going to go back, and I'm going to see that they stick to this protocol. So I said, you got to take these supplements, you got to do this exercise, you got to do... And, you, and all that you see, look at your blood pressure. It's normal. Look at your blood sugar. It's normal. Look, look, at, look at your swollen legs. They're gone. Look at all the weight that you had. It's gone. Look at your memory. Look, and all these things that they had. They stayed with that for two weeks, I heard, after they went home. And then I get a call from my friend who said, well, I tried. I tried. Now it's just arguments. Now they're arguing and yelling at me every day. I want this and I want that. And and they're having friends bring them stuff that, you know, the smoked pork, the sausages that they were used to. And the very thing that caused them to be sick. And how many children of parents run into that dilemma? You help them. Under your supervision, they will do it. But on their own. They don't want to. The idea that everyone gets well and stays well is a myth. And I'll end with this thought. <clears throat> this is the newest area of the, the plasticity of the brain. It's very dynamic. We're now learning for the first time, brand new science this week, that everything in your brain begins to change almost every 24 hours, including how we think in our perception of things from the past and present. And therefore, old ideas that we didn't like, now suddenly we're okay with them. Old things that we did like, suddenly we no longer like them. Old experiences that were not good are now good. Good experiences are now bad. And people couldn't figure this out. So we better be aware that there is no such thing as constant. Everything in life is changing. Now, what we do to protect ourselves is we create daily rituals. And as long as we stick to our rituals, we think that somehow we're okay. There's stability. There's some certainty. There is conformity to our rituals. It's simply not true. You can go through rituals, but at a certain point, the ritual becomes meaningless. We just do it because of some social or religious or cultural or familial responsibilities. We don't want to be excluded. We don't want to be attacked. We don't want to be ridiculed. But it no longer has the vibrancy of authentic harmonization that it once had. So just realize that no matter how you try to stay permanent, everything in the world is changing. 
sometimes at a very subtle level. And the sensitive person is aware of that and ask themselves, should I waste another day being complacent or should I make an effort to make this day vibrant again? Just something to think about. More on that on an upcoming program. I'm Gary Nall. That's our health nutrition segment. We'll be back in a moment. Please stay with us. When the night has come And the land is dark And the moon is the only light we'll see No, I won't be afraid Oh, I won't be afraid Just as long I'd like to welcome all of you from all over the world we're listening right now. I'm Gary Nall. I'm going to go through a lot of different storylines now. All of these are posted. I post about 100 articles per day on progressive themes. And a lot of people in this audience appreciate that they have another source of information. Last evening, I was switching through some of the channels to see what was being discussed and what themes were going on. And one guy was bragging about, you know, we have a really good two-party system. I'm thinking, no, we don't. There's an old Indian saying that the left wing and the right wing are part of the same bird. We have one enormously powerful group of people, oligarchs, some of whom are part of a deep state. They don't care about parties. They don't care about allegiances. They care about power. And they frequently keep their name out of what they own. Like the Rockefellers, you don't see their name on Chase Manhattan Bank. But they have over 100 different corporations. They have controlling interests as stock stock owners. And so they get to say, from being on the board of directors or their, their proxies, what they want. Now, in and of itself, that does make him a bad person. All of us want some control over our lives, and if we had more control and more input, we'd be happy. But what if the control and input you have is to the detriment of others and the benefit of only you or a select few? And that's what we have today. So here's a good example of this, and then I'll give you a simple solution. But anything I'm discussing, when it comes to our talk back, you're welcome to share your point of view as well. This is uh, from uh, Counterpunch. The United States, United Kingdom, and France denounce nuclear ban treaty. Quote, the United States, uh, UK, and France have never shown enthusiasm for banning or and eliminating nuclear weapons. It is not surprising, therefore, that they did not participate in the United Nations negotiation leading to the recent adaptation of the nuclear ban treaty, or that they joined together in expressing their outright defiance of the new treaty. Okay, so let's put this in a more human perspective. The one absolute truth is that if any of the countries, any of the known 17, but it may be more countries that are primary with nuclear weapons, United States, Russia at the top, China right behind that, Pakistan, France, etc. If any of these countries were to set off a nuclear weapon, that's it. The nuclear winters would occur even if we didn't have enormous initial fatalities. And no one is going to be attacked by a nuclear weapon without attacking the person in return. And with the type of people that we have running our military industrial complex, there's just not going to be one nuclear weapon. There's going to be a lot. So it's a nuclear holocaust that is there. Now, we say it's good that we have nuclear weapons and others have nuclear weapons because it's a, it's a deterrent. To the contrary, it is not a deterrent. What is a deterrent is diplomacy and honest, peaceful activities. To have peace in the world, you have to have people who have a history of bringing peace and love to any negotiation. And we don't have that. We have hardline 
secretaries of state, whether it's a Madeleine Albright or Jean Kirkpatrick uh, or at the UN or, uh, or Condoleezza Rice or Hillary Clinton or John Kerry, these are warmongers. These are people who thrive in this vortex of competition at the nuclear arms level. They want to see more arms sold. They have engaged in selling arms to countries that they know are not peaceful in their intent, like Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates. So here are some thoughts. We should have a national third party, whether it's a peace party or a progressive party, to de- to de-arm the world, starting with the United States. Putin does want to see Russia. As, as corrupt as he is on a personal level and the corruption of people around him, uh, and China the same way, they don't want to see what they have built over the last 30 years destroyed. They may be maniacal. They're not stupid. But we are both maniacal and stupid. We have that unique distinction. So we say we want p- peace in the Middle East, and what do we do? We arm those who promote violence. We have the actual proof. WikiLeaks gave us documents showing that we arm with the knowledge that those arms get into the hands of people like ISIS, al Nusra, and al-Qaeda. Well, why doesn't the media call people out on it? But it doesn't. That is ideology. And that is the corruption of ideologies, left and right. So let's just say that we want peace. And I think any responsible person wants to see all the Jews in Israel live in peace without ever fearing that a terrorist attack will blow them up as it has happened in the past or a missile hit. They want to live in peace. The majority do. I will not say that for the Likud party, Netanyahu, or his cabinet. But the majority do. And there's a very strong peace movement in Israel. In fact, former heads of the Mossad, former heads of their well, equivalent to their CIA, former heads of their armed forces have gone public. I saw a documentary, wonderful documentary. It should be shown in every home in America. It would completely re-educate people on the real nature of the conflict in Israel. And they're saying that you can't treat the Palestinians this way. On the other hand, I believe we should want as a as a people to see the Palestinians live in peace and harmony. One of my good friends, in fact, he used to work with me. He was responsible for getting some religious sacred um, artifacts that were the Catholic churches, but in Israel over to the Catholic church and also helped the Jewish government as well. And he said to them at the time, this goes back about 15 years, no, excuse me, um, 18 years, And he was very excited because he said, Gary, I think we can get peace in Palestine. I said, how so? He said, I've got got at least 100 corporations willing to fund and develop uh, factories. I'm not talking about exploited factories, factories where people would make a living wage and to re-commercialize the West Bank and uh, Gaza so people could have work. You got work, you have and homes, you have food, you have, you have uh, schooling. All this was a part of it. And the politicians stopped it. The people didn't. They never knew about it. The politicians did. So here's a recommendation. If you want to start a real arms disarmament program, we have one of two choices. They have set aside one trillion. It'll be 1.5 trillion. 1.5 trillion could completely de ghettoize America completely. We could put over 5 million Americans to work at a living wage with $1.5 trillion. We could give free education to ev- public education. Private education, you want to pay for it, you, you, that's your right, freedom of choice. But for everyone else, we could see that every single student's debts were paid and they could have free education. Imagine what that would do for the good, for the betterment. Or it goes to the military industrial complex, we already have thousands upon thousands of nuclear weapons. It's a multi-billion dollar year industry, and they've got the lobbyists. Here's how this works. And being in, on PFW in Washington, D.C. for 33 years every day, 
five days a week, three o'clock in the afternoon. I had a chance with all my lectures down there to meet a lot of people from the Washington Beltway working in governments. And one guy told me one day after a lecture I did, he said, I can't tell you who I am, but I've been listening to you for a long time. Here's how the system works, Gary. He said, people are not using their computers because they don't want any fingerprints leading back to them. But you work as an, an aide to a senator who's on an appropriations committee. Then you start working behind the scenes quietly, having lunches and breakfasts or having a volleyball workout in the morning with someone who works for a major military contractor. And you're making $150,000 a year as the chief of staff for a, a senator. But you are the gatekeeper. No one gets to see the senator without first going through you. And everyone in Washington knows that's how it works. For every House member and every senator, there's a gatekeeper. And that gatekeeper then is courted by every lobbyist, every, everyone, and you don't have to keep any records of this because it's never done in the office. It's done off the office. And he gave me an example, and he kind of gave himself away because he said, give me an example how it works. I'm playing volleyball with a guy who is a vice president of acquisitions for a major um, weapons maker. And it, playing volleyball, he says, you know, if we get this particular uh, contract, why do you have to stay any longer in that office? Think if you had a half million dollar guaranteed salary, a black American Express credit card, that means there's no limit. You have a leased any car you want. You want a BMW, I want a high-end car, a Jaguar, we pay for it. You want to live in a townhouse, it's our corporate townhouse, but it's for you. We also have a penthouse in New York City. You can stay there when you go to New York. And you'll have use of our corporate jets. And it's all written off. The taxpayer pays for all this. And that's how it works. So you say, well, how many other people? Oh, there's at least 200,000 people who are on the same dole. And how it works is when you go before an appropriations, suddenly the person that you bring in as a consultant to pitch for you as a former four-star general or an admiral uh, or a former Joint Chiefs of Staff member, and they say, we need this weapon system. Now, we don't. In fact, you know that out in the Nevada desert— uh, and also in the Arizona desert, there are tens of thousands of airplanes. Ninety percent of them have never been flown, never been flown. They were bought. They were antiquated before they were finished, but it was cost plus. So people had the, we the people paid for these, plus gave them an enormous profit on top of it. And they go and sit in the desert. I actually posted today. You want to see one of these? Go to GaryNall.com, go to my Facebook, and you'll see photographs from the air of thousands of airplanes that have never flown. Some of these are $20, $30, $40, $100 million each. So, so how tempting is that from going from one of these jobs to suddenly having the rest of your life making millions? That's how we're played. So those are the people you want to bring in to talk about peace in the Middle East? No, they only want war because they make money off the weapons. So who should you bring in for all peace negotiations, especially starting with Israel and Palestine? For Israel, you bring in Rabbi Michael Lerner. You bring Irvi Avenry, a former Knesset leader and liberal peace caucus activist and leader of the Gush Salom. You bring in uh, Gori, G-O-U-R-I, executive director of the largest fund for Israel women's peace activities. Bring in Rabbi McLean. He's co-founder of the Abraham Reunion Movement in Israel. You bring in Rabbi Michael um, Meltkur, uh, head of the Coexistence uh, Center and the Religious Peace Initiative, and Chief Rabbi David Law. For Palestine, you bring in Dr. Ramsey Baroud, Palestinian scholar, and um, uh, Ms. Uh, Huda Abu Abrak, a leading women's peace activist in the West Bank, a Sheikh, um, a Sheikh Bader, Islamic legal scholar and liberal peace uh, member of the Palestinian Council, 
and at least two other sheiks that are leading uh, Sufi teachers in Gaza, like uh, Sheikh Nablan al-Babi. And then someone that would actually negotiate on both sides to make sure that there is equality. Richard Falk, Professor Emeritus of International Law at Princeton. Francis Boyle, a Professor of hum- um, uh, the University of, uh, uh, University of Illinois Law School. Marjorie Cohn, former president of the National Lawyers Guild. Dennis Kucinich, Mary Robinson, former Irish Prime Minister. Alema uh, Gulbi, liberal Nobel Peace activist, leading Jewish Arab women's peace movement in Israel. And uh, Dr. Ruud Lubers, former prime minister and statesman from the Netherlands. Noam Chomsky, uh, Jimmy Carter, Desmond Tutu, Mikhail Gorbachev. Now, those are all people with a history of bringing peace without the threat of weapons, nuclear or drones or invasion or regime change. So if you want the solutions, you have to find the people who have a history in dealing with the solutions. Now, one of the stories I want to share with you before we go to a video clip is we try to bring you the other side of the story. As a longtime award-winning investigative journalist who's broken over 300 original stories, some the first in American history, including the wrong cancer, I take a lot of time and I look for the facts. I never start off asking what facts can I cherry pick that supports a particular ideological political view because I'm apolitical. I don't belong to any of these parties. I'm just looking for the truth wherever it asks. That's what I support. So when I heard all of the demonization of Assad, when I heard the demonization of Gaddafi in Libya, I knew that they were preparing for regime change. And then they just accelerated it and accelerated it until finally they won their regime change with Libya. And I did a show, Bring You People Who Had Lived in Libya, to show you what it was before. And people came up to me yesterday, even on the street, said, I didn't know anything about Gaddafi in Libya. Had I known that, well, had you known it, why didn't you try to look for it? We're not doing our homework. The same with Assad. He was demonized as the next Hitler. Every single thing that you hear about Assad in in Syria now is we've got to go in there, put boots on the ground, we've got to divide Syria up. Syria is a sovereign country. The United States has committed an illegal war acts by being there. Here's what we did. We brought in people who were independent journalists to tell you the truth and we've done at least five programs on that. Here's what you will not see in any media in the United States, including much of the liberal media, including democracy now, because it would go against their own political agenda. This is from Zero Hedge, and it's a story by Tyler Duran. Photos of Aleppo rising, swimsuits, concerts, and rebuilding the first uh, jihadi-free summer. I'll just do one paragraph here. When taxi and bus drivers take journalists to Syria via the Beirut-Damascus highway these days, there's a common greeting that has become a kind of local tradition as the drivers pull into the Damascus area destinations. They confidently tell their passengers, welcome to the real Syria. Local Syrians living in government areas are all too aware of how the outside world perceives the government and the cities under its control. After years of often deceptive imagery and footage produced by occupation terrorist fighters coordinating with an eager Western press bent on vilifying Assad as worse than Hitler, many average Syrians, citizens increasingly take to social media to post images and scenes of Syria that present a different vision. They see their war torn uh, land as fundamentally secular, religiously plural, socially tolerant and slowly returning to normalcy under the stabilizing Assad government and its institutions. As the most intense phase of fighting in Aleppo was unfolding in 2016, veteran journalist Stephen Kisner, which I've had on the program here, took to the editorial pages of the Boston Globe to remind Americans that the media has created a fantasy land concerning Syria. He And here's what Kasner said, quote, from the Boston Globe. Coverage of the Syrian war will be remembered as one of the most shameful episodes in the history of American press. For three years, violent militants have run Aleppo. Their rule began with a wave of repression. 
they posted notices warning residents, don't send your children to school. If you do, we will get, you will get a backpack and you will get a coffin. Then they destroyed factories, hoping that unemployed workers would have no recourse other than to become fighters. They truck looted machinery to Turkey and sold it. The United States has the power to decree the death of nations. It can do so with the popular support because many Americans and many journalists are content with the official story. And it goes on. Now, what I have in my hand here, and those of you who will see this in the next day or two up on YouTube, these are this, for example, the top picture is a beautiful picture in, in Aleppo where they rebuild it. In just months, they rebuild it, and they're conducting an orchestra. And there are all the people in the orchestra in their tuxedos, and they hear all the residents, and they're listening to an orchestra in Aleppo. And down here, this is also Aleppo. And, uh, and here you see uh, a walled-in area with a, a public swimming pool all redone, and people are swimming in the pool. Women are able to wear any outfit they want. They can wear swimming suits. And uh, they're not dressing up in what they had been told they had to because of Sharia. And here is a priest outside of a, a, a church, Catholic church. And here you see on the street all these young men and women are, are repaving the street and putting bricks back and painting. And the Sunni, the Shia, the Alawi, the Christian, the Kurd, the, um, the um, they're all working together as they had before. So we have been told the truth about Syria and how it's rebuilding and how the majority of the people in Syria support the Assad regime. And it was we, the United States, funding to the tune of over $500 million, the terrorists, and thinking that somehow the free Syrian army, which was not free, and it was terrorist groups, just like the White Helmets were terrorist groups. We've been on the wrong side of all these issues. I just want to let you know there's another side to it. And the full story you can read is there. Now, I want you to listen to what this guy, I'm going to play something concerning being offended, because you need to hear this. And then we have political correctness, which is, which is this joy that is the other side of health and safety, which is health and safety, which is a small oppression of our physical movement, so we can't do anything without permission from the state. And political correctness is the oppression of our intellectual movement, so no one says anything anymore in case somebody else gets offended. <laughs> what happens if you say that and someone gets offended? <laughs> well, they can be offended. <laughs> What's wrong with being offended? When did sticks and stones made break my bones stop being relevant? <laughs> Isn't that what you teach children, for God's sake? That's what you teach toddlers. He called me an idiot. Don't worry about him. <laughs> Now you have adults going, I was offended, I was offended, and I have rights. <laughs> well, so what? Be offended. Nothing happens. <laughs> You're an adult. Grow up. Deal with it. I was offended. I don't care. Nothing happens when you're offended. There's nothing. I, I went to the comedy show and, and the comedian said something about the Lord and, and I was offended. And when I woke up in the morning, I had leprosy. <laughs> I want to live in a democracy, but I never want to be offended again. <laughs> well, you're an idiot. <laughs> How do you make a law about offending people? How do you make it an offence to offend people? Being offended is subjective. That has everything to do with you as an individual, or a collective, or a group, or a society, or a community, your moral conditioning, your religious beliefs. What offends me may not offend you. And you want to make laws about this? I'm offended when I see boy bands, for God's sake. <laughs> It's a valid offence. I'm offended. <laughs> They're corporate shills posing as musicians to further a modelling career, and frankly, I'm disgusted. Right? <laughs> well, what am I going to do? Call the cops? Hello, it's me again. <laughs> They're on the telly this time. <laughs> now, I, that was just one part of it. I want you to now watch this. This is kind of a, a parody on some millennials, by no means all, but you'll get the idea. So, Marathon Industries, give me a breakdown. It's a B2B company that provides uh, cloud storage for Fortune 500 companies. Chet, what did the market research turn up? What? Oh, I Googled them, but the results were weird. 
You didn't use the market research database that we spent thousands of dollars a month on and that you were specifically trained to use. I quit. This job is different than I thought it would be. Stop. Does this situation look familiar? A new type of worker has entered the workforce. They're called millennials, and they're terrible. Today, I'm going to teach you all about this new breed of worker so you can avoid misunderstandings in which you feel the need to fire them immediately. In the first reimagination we just saw, Mary makes the classic mistake of not reassuring Chet while offering overflowing amounts of praise. Chet, you were so smart to use Google. That's the perfect way to start the research. You're so smart. Great job. So the uh, conference call is scheduled for 10.30, so that we're on the same page, let's do a pre-call about 9.30 a.m. I don't understand. No noodle, noodles, no more, not, no, nine, 30? Cheryl Sandberg here isn't aware time exists before 10.30 a.m. To her generation, there's a mysterious dead zone after 4 a.m. and before they stroll into work 40 minutes late with their iced coffee. So take that into consideration for scheduling. That's very difficult for me. Fine, I'll, I'll take the call myself. Oh, thank you. Nailed it. Here's that report that you asked for. Oh, thanks. Morgan did exactly what was asked of her. Nothing more, nothing less. She expects a raise and promotion. Thanks. Junior Executive Manager of Data Consulting. Is that better than Assistant Manager of Junior Accounts? Yes. Oh my god, thank you. I'm gonna go call my parents. Now yes. you're getting it. I need to take work off tomorrow for a mental health day. Did you know millennials can actually be exceptionally creative with reasons why they need to miss work? These eccentric excuses are normal to them, and they will be to you, too. Sure, that's a normal thing. Hi, um, I know I only get 10 days paid vacation, but that wouldn't count a three-week Argentinian surf spirit quest, right? No, why would it? Oh. Ugh. Why don't you go home early today? That's it. Any questions? Why even hire millennials? Oh, right. Yeah. All right. That's certainly not all millennials, but I definitely can tell you it's some, having hired some. But millennials are not the issue. Everybody is the issue because we've all participated in bringing us to where we're at at this moment. What are your suggestions for any group of what lessons can we learn now? your opportunity to call in 888-874-4888, 888-874-4888. That's our callback number. And if we have someone on, we'll take that call right now. And uh, no one yet? All right, then I'm going to share this with you. In the time we have left, Yemen's calamity. This is a really good post from Global Research, one of the best uh, groups of information uh, providers that we can find. This is from Professor uh, Ben Mir. Yemen's calamity is of damning proportions, mass starvation, cholera, epidemic, and torture. And what he says here is that the United States has participated in supporting Saudi Arabia, who in turn has committed genocide and we're, they're using our planes, our drones, our intelligence, our satellites, and people are starving. How many people are starving right now is what I'm speaking? About 7 million. So isn't it time that we bore some responsibility and told Saudi Arabia in this conflict and then the world community go in there and rebuild the country because you have the poorest country in the entire Middle East in a two-year conflict by the wealthiest country in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, the best arm in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> and it's just a one-sided beating, all because the people did not want to have Saudi Arabia 
proxy rule, which they had for a long period of time, and discriminating against the non-Sunnis in their country. Just something to remind you, there are conflicts around the world. Let's say hello to Diane from the Bronx. Hi, Diane, your turn. Oh, great, great. How are you doing today? Good. Uh, well, I wanted to speak, it was real early uh, in your show, and you uh, spoke about change, or that uh, about rituals. Yes. Uh, and my thought was, um, I think the only constant and expectation is change. And uh, I've been working on this um, uh, idea that if you uh, conceive that we only have uh, a finite number of days that have been given to us, okay? And, you know, depending on how you, um, you take care of yourself, uh, do enough of the right things, you, you know, you have that number of days. So I'm thinking at the end of, uh, uh, in the morning, I wake up with an attitude of gratitude. Um, I'm thankful, okay, uh, read, uh, read part of the uh, scriptures. At the end of the day, so you've gone through your whole day. Now, at the end of the day, I was sitting on the bed, and I'm thinking about the day and how it, it is going. Good if, for you. And if you think about, you know, how you spent that day, ask yourself, was this a good use of one of my finite days? I appreciate your input. Thank you very much, Diane. Let's talk with Jerry. Uh, from Harlem. Hi, you're on. Hi, this is Jeremiah calling from Harlem. Hi, Jeremiah. Talk with you today, Gary. Um, I just wanted to make one quick point on social media, which obviously is the world we live in today, quote unquote. I mean, yes. someone sends you a tweet and you respond with a Facebook message and then they can reply with a WhatsApp message and then you could send a text message and it's just a merry-go-round of blipping and bleeping. <clears throat> and I just want to recommend that people take the time to if they're going to be on social media to first of all try to regulate that time and second of all concentrate on supporting actually good things that people are doing that local people are doing because it, it troubles me more than anything that you know if someone makes a comment about donald trump it's like oh yeah we hate donald trump five thousand likes and it's that same person says hey i'm doing a presentation could you please be there oh three likes it's almost like we disdain people doing human things within the community. And that's exactly what we need to do, is focus on our community and the people that we know and the people that we love and love us, and not focus on this endless charade and parade and, and the monstrosity that I call the society of the spectacle. Jeremiah, you've, you've made some very important and salient points, and I appreciate your concern and, and the honesty and thank you very much, Jeremiah. Thank you all for listening. Mm -hmm.